Good morning. We live in an increasingly turbulent world where we need to adapt, be able to cope and transform to rising shocks and stresses. Nowhere is the ability to build resilience as good as among the people living in the harshest environments in the world, the semi-arid, water-scarce savannas in the world. Here, climate is extremely variable, droughts and dry spills being normality. Here, climate change is hitting hard. Here, I've spent 15 years of doing science on the ground on building resilience and improving agriculture among small-scale farmers. This is a happy day in my old research village, Samade. Rainfall has come, planting millet on the fringes of the Nigerian Sahel. What I learned during this long period is that small innovations can solve grand challenges. Just look at this, what may be appearing as an insignificant piece of metal, one of the most innovative technologies to transform agriculture in the world. This is a Magoya Ripper Tine. It replaces the plow, the mother of agriculture, which turns the soil, but has been proven to be a very important source of degrading carbon, the largest source of carbon emissions in the world, water scarcity, loss of biodiversity. This is copying nature with minimum disturbance. This is a technology that is similar to the emerging satellite-based computerized precision farming. It's a knife that simply opens up the soil with precision application of water and nutrients, enabling an agricultural revolution, for example, in Latin America. This is another innovation from our research in the highlands of Ethiopia. Small-scale water harvesting, collecting rainfall to bridge dry spells and build resilience in the face of global environmental change. This is, by the way, where it all began. 8,000 years ago, this is the cradle of our civilization. This is where we invented agriculture. Why? Because we entered what we learned in school to call the Holocene the 10,000 years of extraordinary environmental stability since the last deglaciation. This is the Eden's garden of everything we cherish. The beauty of nature establishes itself. The rainforests, the marine systems, the wetlands, rainy seasons become predictable. This is the very precondition for a system like this to operate. This is, in fact, that the Holocene is the prerequisite for our world economy to operate. The scientific message today is as dramatic as it's simple. The Holocene is the only stability state of the planet we know that can support the modern world as we know it. Three years back, I introduced and presented the update of science that we're hitting the ceiling of the ecological capacity of planet Earth to support the modern world as we know it. That we are today at a saturation point, that we have entered a new geological era called the Anthropocene, where we, anthros, humans, are at the driving seat of global environmental change that we can no longer exclude major costs for economies. I introduced the scientific concept of planetary boundaries, which provides a safe operating space, here defined in green, where we become stewards of the environmental processes that are prerequisite for the Earth system to stay in Holocene-like conditions. Today, I'll try to convince you of two things. One is that already today, we're starting to see the impacts and costs for the economies of our current situation. But the second is the more exciting, the grand idea of the opportunity to transition into a new development paradigm of growth and development within the life support systems on Earth. But I must convince you as well that our journey of risk has only begun. We've only reached the aperitif in terms of risks in the world, because we have two giants in the room. The first giant is the social momentum, which is just now starting. We're rapidly moving towards a world with four, five, six billion people with a right to development and lifestyles equivalent to an average European. This is a positive momentum starting now. The second giant in the room is that so far, Mother Earth has been very forgiving. The Earth system has been applying its biogeochemical systems, its resilience, to dampen and protect us. She has been incredibly forgiving by allowing us to have environmental impacts absorbed without any cost to our economy, the biggest subsidy of all to our lifestyles. It's only in the last 20 years we started to see evidence that the Earth system is starting to send invoices back into the economy. These are truly two giants colliding and they're colliding right at this moment in time. And this is why it requires us to think, do we need a deep mind shift in order to secure prosperity for a world that is moving towards nine billion 
people. We must recognize that we've moved very quickly from a small world on a big planet to today a big world on a small planet. But you know, before even the tremors felt from these giants stepping and dancing on the Earth system, we see the implications on the economy already today at 0.8 degrees warming so far. We see a freak hurricane veering right in over New York, probably pushed down because of the collapse of the Arctic jet stream, pushing down cold air, flooding Manhattan to tremendous cost, symbolically putting the New York Stock Exchange and Wall Street underwater, showing that there is a financial, ecological, big-scale cost already today. Forest fires in Russia, combined with 12 years of drought in Australia, hitting the volatility of food price markets in the world, feeding back right into the Arab Spring, contributing to trigger that whole social transformation to scale. The first example of a regional scale, political, social, ecological, abrupt change occurring at the same time, a triple whammy indeed. Deforestation occurring at a very large scale to the detriment of local communities and biodiversity. Now, now, you'll think I've snatched this from the Lord of the Rings. You're just waiting for, for the orcs to run across this mortal landscape. But no, this is a recent photography from my friend and colleague Matthias Klum from National Geographic. This is from Borneo. This is 75% loss of rainforest for palm oil plantations. We're learning that this is affecting regional rainfall. This is affecting air pollution. It's affecting regional economies with feedbacks back into the global market. It is every finance minister's concern of keeping biomes in a stable state in a globalized world. This is a new situation. We need to consider global tipping points, that we are pushing ourselves to a point where things can abruptly change and push ourselves out of, kicking ourselves out of the Holocene Eden's garden. Just to give you one example, 2012 is potentially a scientific and earthwise watershed. Greenland, a permanent ice sheet, a white permanent surface that reflects back 90% of incoming heat to space. In fact, we know now that the polar regions are massive planetary coolers. These are actually prerequisite for the Holocene stability. Now, in 2012, during Two weeks in July, the entire Greenland ice sheet is melting for the first time in observed history. Now, can you imagine just the color shift from a white reflective surface, reflecting back 90% of heat, to a slightly darker liquid surface corresponds to roughly 300 exajoules of new heat into the atmosphere. That's more than the annual consumption of energy in the United States. Denmark bypasses China and the US as the largest climate-forcing nation on Earth momentarily. This is when planet Earth kicks in her feedbacks. This is when she goes from being a friend to being a foe. This is why we can say profoundly from science, we have empirical evidence that there's no reason for inaction. This is the time we need to start acting. So what shall we do? Well, to begin with, there's rising and very, very exciting new thinking around a new development paradigm, moving away from the belief that we can live on growth without any limits towards a new paradigm of growth within the life support system on Earth, reconnecting our economies to the biosphere, reconnecting our societies to the living systems on Earth as the basis for our own prosperity. You might think that this is a romantic view, but it's not. And in fact, it's not about protecting nature, it's about protecting our own prosperity. When Angel Guria, the OECD Secretary General, in a dialogue I had with him just a month back, says that humanity is on collision course with nature, he says so, not to protect nature, but to protect jobs and prosperity in the future. When Ban Ki-moon, the United Nations General Secretary, launched his report, Resilient People, Resilient Planet, just a year back, for the United Nations Earth Summit, the Rio Plus 20, the equivalent of the Brundtland Commission on Sustainable Development, written by heads of state in the world, the conclusion is our current development paradigm has come to the end of the road. They're listening to science and saying that tipping points can no longer be excluded. We now need a new idea, a new grand thinking into a new future. When the heads of IMF, and the World Bank are supposed to talk about jobs and economic growth at the World Economic Forum, they say that climate change and global sustainability is now a prerequisite for our own prosperity. 
These are new ideas, which means we need to retire this old notion of the three separate pillars of sustainable development, environment, society, and the economy. We must simply admit that this has become a Mickey Mouse economy, <laughs> where economic growth has occurred at the expense of the environment and society. We must now transform our conceptual thinking into an economy that serves society, that operates within the life support systems on Earth. And recent science suggests that this can be done. We have recently contributed, leading scientists in the world, a new framework of growth within Earth system limits for the very important process of trying to transform the Millennium Development Goals. As you may be aware, in 2000, the world's nations underwrote the commitment to have hunger and poverty in the world. Now, these are to be transformed into sustainable development goals of new framework unifying universally all nations in the world towards sustainable development. We propose that this could be the way to do it. Here you see six goals that matter for our own prosperity, from an energy transition to a low-carbon economy to safe, sustainable food production, ecosystems, livelihoods, governance, water security. And for each of these, having science-based definition of goals at the planetary scale, for example, a basically fossil fuel-free future for energy, setting social goals like eradicating poverty and securing the right to development for all people on Earth, and then designing the economy once we have rebooted our minds to serve these goals. We know we need a global price on carbon. We know that we need a transition to a circular economy, which the European Union, for example, is now looking at, instead of selling things to transform all natural resources, energy fluxes and nutrients in circular processes, selling services instead of products. We know that we can take away the 600 billion US dollars a year of subsidies locking us in our dangerous fossil fuel energy dependent future. So a paradigm like this can, in fact, make a difference. And it's a large change moving from a growth without limits to a growth within limits type of paradigm. And the beauty is, it's not about limits to growth. It's not about, you know, basically, you think that the only choices we have is either to essentially say that the party is over, there's no room for more development in the world, or it is about contracting and converging, everyone suffers, or it's about putting the heads in the sand, which is roughly what policy is doing today. We think this could be a fourth way, a transition to a safe future within safe operating space. Your question now is, of course, can this be done? The solutions are there. Just look at this for the energy transition in the world. Up until 10 years back, you could argue that solar and wind were small things, a few percent of the energy mix. Look at this data from Christian Azar from the Charlemagne University, showing that solar and wind are coming to scale, penetrating more than 10% of markets in the world, really coming to scale. Ecosystems serving the economy at big scale. This is the classic Catskill catchment example where sustainable management of forests is supporting freshwater supply to New York, saving millions of dollars in a system where we work with nature, not against nature. We need to produce 50% more food in the world. We need a new green revolution. How can this be done without destroying biodiversity, nutrients, climate and land? Agriculture is the largest source of biodiversity loss and climate change. We think there are innovations for a triply green revolution in water harvesting, recirculating nutrients through productive sanitation, taking our excreta back into agriculture, and by abandoning plowing. This can feed the world. Science shows that we can feed a world of 9 billion people through sustainable agriculture. Science is now mobilizing, stepping up to the challenge. Future Earth is the largest show in town in Earth system research for global sustainability, acting on our own evidence, a positive step towards solutions. Urbanization in the world is the largest dynamics we have. We have solutions for ecosystem-based sustainable urban planning. And remember that 60% of the cities in the world have not even been built yet. Crisis can be the source of major transformation towards positive development. The largest marine system in the world is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Subject to tremendous crises of climate change, pollution from agriculture and overfishing, this system was in a crisis 10, 15 years back. Now governance has been transformed into a new sustainable strategy where large tracts, 30% of the area, is actually protected as major, major large no-catch areas building resilience and putting the Great Barrier Reef in a new trajectory of sustainability and resilience in the face of growing change. 
So my message to you today is that yes, we have major challenges. We're hitting the ceiling, we cannot exclude catastrophic tipping point. But we have the knowledge and we have the technology to navigate a good Anthropocene within a safe operating space. It will require a deep mind shift. It will require us to reconnect our societies to planet Earth. It will require us to deconnect our societies to the biosphere. It is, in truth, about rebooting our mental hard drives. It's about 200 countries becoming planetary stewards of a harmonious transformation towards a new development paradigm of growth and prosperity within Earth's limits. This is our human quest. It's, in fact, about intertwining the world with planet Earth in social ecological harmony. These were actually prepared by my 12-year-old daughter, Vera. And uh, she told me, you know, Dad, I think you have a scientific support to end your TED Talk in the following way. Resilient people, resilient planet, in a peaceful transformation. Thank you.